are we doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past? The best way to ensure that we do not is education. One of my primary goals in introducing this resolution is to ensure the younger generation will know about Fred Korematsu. All of us, young and old, who care about our country don't need to just recognize Fred Korematsu, but also learn from his story and emulate his exemplary life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we will hear from uh, Karen Korematsu and Lori Banai. I believe we are uh, having them call in. Okay. Hello? Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Is this uh, Chair uh, Van Brommer? This is. This is. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, including me uh, in this uh, hearing. Uh, and thank you for bringing this um, to everyone's um, attention and consideration. Um, I must say, I have a very bad echo here. Uh, is we there some way the audio person can adjust that? I don't know. We can hear you pretty darn well. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'll try to talk. It's a little bit disconcerting when you're can't really um, when you're getting all this feedback. Um, but I I will just try to um, continue talking, and then you can interrupt me if there's an, an issue. If that's all right with you. Sure. Um, well, thank you again. Um, uh, um, uh, Chair Van Brommer and and the um, and the uh, New York uh, City Council, the um, especially Councilman Daniel Drum, I assume is there as well. Yes. And um, I would like to thank him for um, bringing this proposal to you. Uh, you know, he honored my father um, several years ago when I was in uh, New York City. And that was um, that was very um, exciting, and, and uh, we were I was there um, uh, on behalf of um, of uh, you know working with teachers really across this country, uh, and which is education was a big you know part of, of what my father uh, pursued in his mission after uh, his conviction was um, was overturned in 1983, but just. Um, uh, briefly, you know, to remind everyone, I, I'm not sure exactly what was said before, so I'm, I'm sorry uh, if I'm repeating myself. So you can you can tell me if I am. Uh, uh, my you know my father was born in Oakland, California, and, and was an American citizen, and he learned about the Constitution in high school, uh, and he was um, an ordinary kid just like everyone else that enjoyed hanging out with his friends, and he was involved in sports. Um, but, you know, when, and even before the war, he had tried to enlist um, in the service. Um, in, he tried with his, actually his Caucasian friends, and, and when they went to a post office for applications to first enlist, the, they tried the, um, the National Guard, and the uh, officer, the uh, National Guard officer, refused an application to my father because he had a Japanese name. And then again, when they went over to the table that was, Coast Guard, that the same um, the same treatment uh, was um, endured by my father, and you know he said at that time, but I'm an American and I want to serve my country, and he didn't understand that type of treatment, um, and he was so humiliated, uh, and this was before Pearl Harbor, but that didn't stop him. He still wanted to be involved in the war effort, so he. Uh, went ahead and went to welding school and worked into the shipyards and worked in the small holes of ships and you know that was even before ear protection uh, and uh, in the day after Pearl Harbor there was a note in his time slot saying that he had a report uh, to the Boilermakers Union and he was fired uh, for just being you know Japanese even though he was Japanese American and he endured even uh, discrimination growing up. He was refused a haircut. He was refused service in a restaurant. Um, he, you know, he was certainly discriminated against and, and faced, um, you know, prejudice and, and racism. So, you know, those are the types of, of uh, experience that, that he had. And, 
you know, as I tell students, you know, the, those those type of experiences stay with you and, and in some part um, are responsible for the decisions that you, you make. So when he when Executive Order 9066 was issued, he, he thought it was wrong. Why should he go to a prison camp uh, when he had never been charged with a crime? In, fa in fact, for all Japanese Americans, all due process was denied. And that's a very part, a very important part of, of this of this story. Um, and and so when the opportunity came um, to have his case, uh, as Mr. Bessick said, uh, who is from the ACLU of Northern California, if need be, uh, we'll take it all the way to the Supreme Court. He thought for sure that the Supreme Court would see that that uh, this act was unconstitutional. And uh, he was, uh, people, a lot of people don't know, he was vilified and ostracized from his own Japanese-American community from the day that he entered the detention assembly center in the San Francisco Bay Area before he was uh, shipped off to the, one of the, uh, the 10 uh, incarceration camps, his family, and, and he went to Topaz, Utah. Uh, no one wanted anything to do with my father because he stood up against the government. And, and so he always went it alone. In fact, my brother and I and our family was ostracized from our own Japanese-American community here in the Bay Area. Um, you know, until the time my father's case was reopened in 1983. But he was never bitter or angry. He was the type of person that just believed in his principles of right and wrong and, and lived his, his life, uh, you know, up until that time as, um, as an American who believed that being an American was to be civically engaged. And that's another point of of Fred Cuomo's Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution is is the importance of being a part of 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 the solution instead of being part of the problem. And he gave that back through community service, through Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, was president of his own um, international Japanese or um, international Alliance Club uh, chapter here in the Bay Area, um, twice even. And uh, I was involved in this church and in our church and, you know, really in, and later on in, and in the voting polls. Uh, so that's the kind of, 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 um, of person that he was. And but until his case was reopened in 1983, I didn't even know that he had never given up hope that someday he would be able to reopen his um, Supreme Court case. You know, he waited almost 40 years. Uh, he shared that with my mother, but my brother and I never never knew that. Uh, and so when his conviction was over, overturned or vacated in 1983, he could have very well said, well, Japanese-American community, you didn't want anything to do with me. Why should I have anything to do with you? But he, you know, he wasn't like that. He welcomed everyone with open arms, and he, you know, treated everyone like he wanted to be treated. Uh, and so he, he, he crisscrossed this country for education. He wanted to be sure that, you know, in some in, in some mo small part that something like the Japanese American incarceration wouldn't happen again. And look what we're happening ha what's happening today. I mean, he would be so disgusted and so disappointed that we still haven't learned our, our lessons um, you know, from history. Uh, but you know, he he also just never let that stop him. And I think, you know, that's the reason for, you know, his, his tenacity for education, for helping with the redress and reparations movement um, to, to make sure that, uh, you know, that apology was made with the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 being signed by, by President Reagan. Uh, and he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in, in, in 1998. But he received those honors on behalf of, of, of of everyone that had been incarcerated. He, he just never was the type of person that just had this big, you know, ego. Um, I, I have to point out that his first honorary doctorate of laws degree was given to him by City University of New York. And this was back um, on May 27th in 1988. So um, that was very, um, very exciting. And he was, you know, so honored. Um, and and uh, was appreciative uh, of you know receiving um, this this great award, and then he received three others um, after that before he passed away. Uh, but um, he he his legacy is is about 
you know, remembering and, and protecting our, our, our civil rights and, uh, and, and, to, to, and to speak up. Um, you know, I, I work now through uh, the Fred T. Cormontu Institute that I uh, founded in 2009 through, um, you know, for education. I've actually worked with the National Council for Social Studies and spoken to uh, a couple of their different um, conferences uh, I have, I don't know if um, Rosella Clyde is in the audience, but she's with the Greater Metropolitan New York of, of uh, Social Studies Teachers and brought me to New York City uh, to honor me and to have me speak uh, to, to students and uh, to their organization uh, as well. So I'm carrying on my father's work in, in education. And, you know, it's, it's my age range of audience now is five years old to 100, but I can tell you even five-year-olds and six-year-olds understand the difference between right and wrong. And through the Korematsu Institute, we have created uh, curriculum kits that we send out to teachers free of charge. So any teacher, uh, elementary, middle school, high school, we have lesson plans for all of them, uh, can go to the KorematsuInstitute.org website to sign up for our curriculum kits free of charge. That's, we want to make sure that teachers have these materials in their hands uh, because we know education budgets are, are cut and we really want to have them understand the, the lessons of history you know, we, from generation to generation. It's important uh, and e even to bring in, we bring in now the, the relevancy of those, of those um, issues. Um, and so, uh, also, I'd like to say, in reading this um, wonderful um, resolution um, that you have recognized it as Fred, Coromat Fred C. Cormontu Day, I would like to um, respectfully uh, recommend that the day be recognized as Fred Cormontu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. Uh, that's what the state of California, Hawaii, Virginia, and Florida. Uh, recognize that day and to standardize that because really the importance is about civil liberties and the Constitution that we all as Americans uh, across this country you know in 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 New York City uh, need to remember and to keep fighting for and to uphold um, I've even spoken at uh, Columbia University Teachers College to, to incoming teachers there and to students that they brought in for, for that conference. So our efforts, uh, in, especially in New York City and, and New York, uh, is, is, is great. I know what's working with the National Council for Social Studies that, uh, and our, our conference actually this year is gonna be in, in San Francisco and they asked me to be the co-chair. But we, we, we have teachers from New York City that are coming to, to attend. And uh, we, you know, feel that um, we need to support teachers uh, nationwide. And uh, and you know, New York City, I believe, is the largest um, uh, school district in the United States. And so that's why why we feel that this is such a, a great honor. Um, but also because the focus is on education and our civil liberties and the Constitution. And if my father were um, there, he would say to you, um, thank you for standing up for what is right. Thank you, Karen, um, very much. You are rightly proud of your uh, father's uh, legacy. Is, uh, we've, I've actually never done this before with a call into my committee, but uh, is Lori Benai on the call or available? Okay. Maybe she's coming after me. Yes, I believe I so, know. Karen. So does that mean we're losing Karen? Oh, okay. Uh, so I think we're going to say thank you, Karen, um, <laughs> because I think Lori Benai is going to take the line. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions from the committee that, since you have me on the line, that you would like to ask? So don't disconnect Karen just yet. Um, okay. Is there anyone who has questions? Danny. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for participating. This is Councilmember Danny Drum, the sponsor of the bill, and I also had the opportunity to meet you at the uh, UFT conference, the social studies conference that you mentioned in your testimony. And, you know, I'm also the chair of the Education Committee in the City Council. So oh. I'm, so I'm very grateful today to Councilmember Van Bremer for holding this hearing. 
because this is really of major importance, not just to Asian Americans, but to all Americans. And uh, making January 30th Fred T. Korematsu Day, I think, is going to be an opportunity for teachers throughout the New York City school system to teach about your father's life and the significance of what it meant for the liberation of all people. And I think when I met you, I might have told you that I am a gay male, I am an openly gay teacher in the New York City public school system, and as a gay person, I can relate uh, to the experiences that your father had as well in terms of the fight and the struggle for um, equality in this country. So I think this is a lesson that uh, really rings well today uh, in light of everything that's happening in Washington, D.C., and I'm very grateful that you were able to join us at this hearing. Well, thank you very much, uh, Councilman uh, Drum. I, I really appreciate uh, all your efforts here and you also um, upholding uh, education. I'll look forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. And I think now we are going to uh, say goodbye until okay. we hear from Lori Benai. All right. Thank you all very much for thank this you. consideration. Bye bye. And while we're waiting for Lori, let me recognize we've been joined by uh, council members Peter Koo from Queens and Helen Rosenthal from Manhattan, also members of our Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations Committee. Great. Is Lori Benai on the line? Yes, I am. Great. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is uh, Jimmy Van Bramer. I'm the chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs and Libraries, and you are um, here with several members of the committee and the prime sponsor of the resolution, Councilmember Drum, and uh, about 50 people in the City Hall Chambers who are listening. Would you like to begin your testimony? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, members of the committee. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you. I wish I could be there with you in New York. Um, so I uh, wear several hats today in addressing you. Uh, I teach at Seattle University School of Law, where I serve as director of the Fred C. Korematsu Center for Law and Equality, which works in Mr. Korematsu's name on civil rights and criminal justice issues across the country. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Okay. I am on, I am very honored uh, also to have been on the legal team that successfully challenged uh, Mr. Korematsu's conviction in the 1980s. Um, I'm also a sensei, a third generation Japanese American, and during World War II, my parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles were taken from their homes in Los Angeles and incarcerated at Manzanar in the California Mojave Desert uh, simply because of their race. Um, so through these different lenses, um, I ask you to adopt January 30th as Fred T. Korematsu Day um, as a means to honor not only the example he set for all of us, um, but also, as Karen mentioned, to set aside time to reflect on the continuing lessons of the wartime incarceration. Um, of course, the main reason I hope the New York City Council will establish Fred T. Korematsu Day is to recognize this really extraordinary man who I had the honor of getting to know. Um, while he was self-spoken and self-effacing, he was a person of really great principle and courage um, who refused incarceration um, because he knew that what the government did during World War II was wrong. Um, but a day to recognize Fred would, of course, be about much more than him. Um, it would, I hope, call on the city to reflect on the many lasting lessons of his life and his cases, among them the danger of ignorance and fear and the need for constant vigilance to protect civil rights, especially during times of fear. During World War II, as you all know, the country turned on the Japanese-American community out of ignorance and fear. Fred reminded us after 9-11 that the same brand of ignorance and fear 
led to the similar demonization of Muslims, persons of East, Middle Eastern descent, and those perceived look, to look like them. And unfortunately, that ignorance and fear persists today. And ignorance and fear and stereotype built on them continue to result in the targeting of other historically marginalized communities, communities of color, immigrant communities, including blacks, Mexican-Americans, and others. A day in his honor would also provide the opportunity to reflect on the importance of knowing and understanding our Constitution, not only the rights it conveys, but also the responsibilities of citizenship. One of Fred's most powerful messages was that our rights are fragile, given life and preserved only if each of us values them and is willing to speak out and to fight to preserve them. Fred spoke out during World War II in challenging the wartime incarceration. He spoke out 40 years later in the 1980s when he reopened his case based on proof that the government suppressed, altered, and destroyed material evidence to validate its actions during World War II. And after his case was over, he continued to speak up, telling anyone who would listen, especially students, as Karen said, of the need to be civically engaged, run for office, to challenge injustice, especially injustice wrought against the most vulnerable among us. So members of the committee, I hope you'll take this opportunity to designate January 30th as a day not to only honor Fred, but also to carry on his message that each of us has a duty to be vigilant to ensure that we cherish and protect the constitutional rights of every person. Thank you so much for letting me patch in, and I'm really glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony and for calling in. And uh, though you can't see her, we've been joined by Councilwoman Elizabeth Crowley uh, from, from Queens and uh, other members of the committee who've already been recognized. Um, are there any questions for Lori Benai? Councilmember Drummond, would you like to uh, say anything about uh, the testimony from Lori Benai? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair uh, Van Bremer. And again, thank you for holding this hearing. Um, no, just to um, again reiterate the fact that I think this is an important lesson for all students in the United States of America to learn. And it's a piece of history that has been hidden and invisible for too long of a period of time. And so I think part of the reason why we wanted to have this hearing, and again, like I said to the chair, um, I'm very grateful for holding it, is to make it visible and to let people know about Fred's story so that hopefully we never repeat this again in our country, although times today are not looking so good in terms of what's happening in Washington, D.C. But to thank you for your legal work on this as well, um, and, um, and, and, and just to, to again say thank you for all that you've done to, to, to make today possible. Well, thank you so much for, for bringing this up and, and, and hopefully making this happen. Thank you very much uh, uh, for calling in and for being part of the hearing. We could hear you perfectly, uh, even if the connection was, was not so great on your side, but uh, no fault of uh, our tech folks in the back of the room who are doing their best. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Lori, for calling in and for being part of this very important hearing. Thank you so much. Goodbye. And I think that ends our experiment with calling in uh, to hearings uh, for today. Um, so we will begin with the first panel of folks who are actually uh, here in the audience. And again, uh, we'll go five at a time. Uh, uh, everyone whose name will be called will sit in one of those five uh, terrific seats and then we'll take turns. We're gonna go to a two minute clock for everyone who's here. So please be as uh, concise as you can with your comments, um, uh, though you may have prepared something uh, slightly longer. So we will go with, and I apologize if I um, don't read all of the names correctly because I am getting much older and I cannot see uh, the piece of papers that are in front of me. But uh, the first one, uh, Robert Johnson from uh, the Korematsu Center for Law and Equality. Is Robert here? Okay, why don't you uh, come up and take a seat. And it looks like Kath Goveding from the Korematsu Institute. Could that be even remotely close? Um, that's sort of what that looks like to me, no? She's already Goulding? Goulding? Kat, or Kath Goulding? Yeah, 
Oh, great. Sorry about that. Um, Albert Kahn from CARE. Great. George Hyros. Yes. Great. And Jennifer Hayashida. Great. So these are uh, the first five, and we have four other panels um, following this one. I think we might have some other folks who have testimony, but why don't we uh, start? Um, uh, why don't we start with Robert, and then we'll go down the list um, one by one as I called uh, the names. Your microphone. Make sure the little red light is on. Okay. Great. Here we go. My name is Robert Johnson, and I am a partner in the Aiken Gump Law Firm. We are a global law firm with more than 200 lawyers in our New York office. We proudly represent the Korematsu Center for Law and Equality in connection with the Muslim travel ban litigations. We filed our first amicus curiae brief on behalf of the Korematsu Center and a group of affiliated friends of the court just days after the announcement of the first executive order imposing the travel ban. As of this date, we have filed 10 iterations of our brief in various courts, including the Supreme Court. Now that these cases have been sent back to the district courts, we expect to file revised versions of our amicus brief on appeal. I'm here today to express my personal support for the resolution. The designation of Fred Korematsu Day is appropriate because a commemorated day becomes an opportunity for teaching and learning. Curious minds will ask, who was this Fred Korematsu and why are we commemorating him? Teachers will have an opportunity to incorporate Fred's story into their lesson plans. The media will have an occasion to do features about the Japanese American incarceration. All of this is desirable because we have important lessons to learn from Fred Korematsu and through him important lessons about the Japanese American incarceration during World War II. These are lessons about prejudice, about our treatment of minorities, about honor, about pers perseverance, about constitutional law and our judiciary, and about how things can go horribly wrong when the truth is hidden from our judicial system, and about redemption when the truth is finally revealed. I say this from my own personal experience of working on these amicus briefs in the past nine months. I myself learned so much more about Fred and about these issues during our work on the travel ban litigation. There's so much about his story that I didn't learn in school. Working on these briefs, I learned more detail about Executive Order 9066, issued by FDR some 10 weeks after Pearl Harbor. The executive order used neutral language with respect to race and ethnicity, but it gave the military broad authority to remove entire classes of people from zones considered to be of military significance. The Empire of Japan was, of course, our enemy, and the war had just begun for Americans, but there was an underlying anti-Japanese American sentiment broadly shared among many people here in the United States, and our government took advantage of that statement. What we learned in the 1980s was that the purported military necessity was a fraud. We learned that the War Department had suppressed evidence from the FBI and other agencies that undermined the justification of the removal and incarceration. Commemoration of Fred Korematsu Day will give New Yorkers a reason to see a film or a television documentary such as Never Give Up by Holly Yasui or And Then They Came For Us by Abby Ginsberg or to see a screening of the film version of the Broadway play Allegiance by Jay Kuo inspired by the experience of George Takei or to read from the many books about Fred. Through these works we can remind ourselves of what happens when prejudice overruns the truth and what we as Americans must not do in similar situations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and that's exactly how you do it. You read as fast as you could, and then when, you, when the buzzer sounded and I was about to chime in, you skipped because I was following along and, and concluded it. So uh, note to self, uh, thank you very much for your testimony, and uh, we'll just uh, go left from there. Press the, yep. Hello, my name is Kath Golding, and I'm here representing the Korematsu Institute. And uh, today we gather to testify to Fred Korematsu's legacy and the educative implications of establishing a Fred Korematsu Day in the state of New York. I come to speak as a daughter and granddaughter of Japanese Americans incarcerated during World War II, as a resident of Brooklyn, New York, and finally as a researcher of the endeavors to teach the history of the Japanese American incarcerations to public audiences. In 1942, Fred Korematsu defied the racially motivated exclusion orders issued by the U.S. government. And while his case would eventually be lost in the Supreme Court, the value of Korematsu's case lies in its unmasking of the errancy and fragility of our democracy. 
I'm going to skip a paragraph for time's sake. The circumstances of our current times brings me to the decision, the decision before us today to establish a single day commemorating Fort Fred Korematsu. The establishment of a Fred Korematsu Day here in New York, a sanctuary city, a city long populated and bolstered by immigrants, is a potent symbolic gesture. It is also a potent pedagogical move, too. It offers us a day, a pause, and a reason to collectively consider the meaning of dissent and vigilance in upholding liberal democracies. This year, I became involved with the Korematsu Institute, an organization founded by Karen Korematsu. The Institute hosts workshops in, uh, for K-12 teachers and has developed a popular and widely distributed curriculum. In August, the Korematsu Institute offered a week-long curriculum uh, writing institute for teachers in Berkeley, California. As a co-facilitator of this institute, I saw firsthand the enthusiasm of teachers who traveled as far from places like New Mexico, Brooklyn, and Massachusetts, and the deep curricular residences they, re they located in Korematsu's story and the history of the Japanese-American incarceration. These educators spoke of the meaning this history might have for their socioeconomically diverse populations, meanings of citizenship, belonging, and ways of being in the world. The Korematsu Institute's educational mission is to uphold and the profound limitations and possibilities too that lie in our day-to-day -day work to uphold our Constitution. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Albert Tan, and I serve as the legal director for CARE New York, a Muslim civil rights group. I'm proud to testify in support of uh, Fred Korematsu Day, and I applaud Chair Van Bremer and Council Member Drum for having today's hearing. At one of this country's darkest moments, Fred Korematsu was brave enough to step forward and oppose a president's unlawful order and fight for the best version of American democracy. We must recognize that New York City was actively complicit in the Japanese internment. Immediately following World, uh, Pearl Harbor, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia placed all New Yorkers of Japanese descent under house arrest, and hundreds were detained at Ellis Island. Uh, New York can never fully atone for our past, but we can commit that we never repeat it. And this hearing could not be more timely because in 2015, then-candidate Trump said he would certainly implement a database that tracks all Muslims living in the United States. This is why today so many Muslim New Yorkers fear that history may repeat itself. Last November, I gave a training at NYU speaking to a room full of Muslim students still in shock from the election. One student told me that she had spoken to Representative Mike Honda, who was interned as a child. She had asked him whether a Muslim internment was possible, and he said yes. My answer when she asked me the same question was no, and not because of our laws, and not because of our constitution, but because the people of this city, the state, and this country will never again stand silently by when our neighbors are being imprisoned. Today, by commemorating Fred Korematsu, we help show all New Yorkers that promise is being upheld, and that we will not stand by again. With passage of this resolution, this council will transform January 30th into an enduring reminder of this city's commitment to civil rights and a caution against anyone who tries to exploit moments of danger and grief into calls for discrimination. I thank the council for its support and for helping to defend any New Yorkers who face discrimination. Thank you. Hi, I'm George Hirose. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the uh, Japanese American Citizens League of New York. Uh, thank you, Chair Van Bremer, for scheduling this hearing. Uh, thank you for the committee, uh, and thank you very much to Daniel Drone for uh, 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 sponsoring this resolution. Um, I'm testifying on behalf of the Japanese American Citizens League, New York chapter, in order to ask you to support the passage of Resolution 792. Uh, this resolution is important not only to New York City Asian community, but to communities of all colors. Resolution 792 represents essential values of the great majority of New Yorkers that we will never accept discrimination based on race, religious orientation, or any other marginalized identity. Here in New York City during World War II, many innocent people in our community were targeted and imprisoned on Ellis Island or under house arrest without due process of law. To make things worse, when those were, who were incarcerated in the U.S. government concentration camps tried to come to New York, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia publicly stated that he did not want any Japs coming to New York. 
Though only a college student at the time, Fred Korematsu refused to accept this gross breach of, justice, breach of justice, challenging the legality of Executive Order 9066 at the Supreme Court in Korematsu versus the United States, 1944. In doing so, Korematsu acted like a true American in standing up for his rights as a citizen. After the war, Korematsu became an important role model as he continued to fight for Japanese-American redress and reparations, resulting in the passage of the Civil Liberty Acts of 1988. Fred Kuramatsu was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Bill Clinton in 1988 and was an ardent civil rights activist until the end of his life in 2006. He was an outspoken proponent for the fair, just, and equal treatment for all people regardless of race, gender, or religion. The establishment of this day is not just about the accomplishments and actions of one man, but is a highly symbolic acknowledgement of how racially motivated policies and the infringement of our basic civil rights are morally wrong. This resolution is clearly not just about one community, but extends to all marginalized communities who are easily targeted when the political tide turns against them. Japanese Americans are, not, are the only group that has, that has been mass incarcerated by the U.S. government. The Japanese American community in New York City is painfully aware and very concerned that the same type of racist and unjust executive orders that incarcerated Japanese Americans 75 years ago are being re repeated today with the Muslim and immigrant communities. Uh, now is the time to make a strong statement that racial profiling and persecution is not acceptable. Unless we acknowledge the mistakes of the past, we cannot move forward as a society. Lastly, I would like to thank uh, uh, Chair, Chairperson Jan James Van Bremer for scheduling this hearing, and I would also urge the Committee on Cultural Affairs to proceed with a speedy vote so that New York City can join the states of California, Virginia, Florida, and Hawaii in celebrating an official Feti Karamatsu Day on January 30th. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the recommendation. And last but not least, on this panel. Um, thank you. My name is Jennifer Hayashida. I'm a former faculty member at Hunter College, the City University of New York, where I taught for 11 years and ran their Asian American Studies program from 2008 to 2017. My estimate is that in a class of 30 students, 5 to 10 of my students, 90% of whom had attended New York City public high schools, would know that the World War II mass incarceration of Japanese Americans even happened. Fewer, though, knew that two-thirds of those quote-unquote Japanese people who had been locked up without due process were U.S. citizens. Most importantly, I never had a student who came into my class knowing that there were Japanese Americans who resisted the incarceration and stood up for justice as Fred Korematsu did. The history of the incarceration serves as a clarion call for so many students who learn about it. Coincidentally, in the weeks following the most recent presidential election, students in my class on Asian American literature were reading Citizen 13660, Japanese American author and illustrator Mine Okubo's graphic novel that chronicles her experience at the Topaz quote unquote war relocation center in Utah. This is the same camp, camp where my uncle Alan spent the first three years of his life and where Fred Korematsu was eventually incarcerated. As the pitch of Islamophobia and xenophobia steadily increased last fall and winter, my students wanted to bring Citizen 13660 to the streets of our city. Self-organized groups of students read passages from Okubo's book in unison in public spaces at Hunter College on Fifth Avenue and in the Trump Tower lobby, technically, if not spiritually, a public place. They engaged in respectful conversations with curious passers-by, some even going so far as to give away their copies of the book in an effort to educate the public. This resolution is a crucial reminder to all of us that history is not what we imagine or wish it had been, but that it lives with us always and requires continuous vigilance. January 30th will be a day for all of us of all racial backgrounds to unite in large and small ways and reflect upon the continued legacy of a man who insisted that civil rights be granted to all of us, regardless of skin color. This resolution does not simply honor the past, but gives energy and hope to those of us who continue to work towards justice today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as someone who worked for our public library systems before I was elected eight years ago, uh, that is um, a really, really amazing action. Um, uh, to go ahead and read the book all over the city of New York, including in the lobby of the Trump Tower. Would you like a copy? Book. I would love one. Um, uh, and uh, I, too, participated in some demonstrations inside that 
semi-quasi <laughs> public Great. lobby. The gilded lobby. Yes, yes, uh, with lots and lots of Secret Service agents watching us, uh, although we were just with a bunch of artists, um, and uh, uh, still they watched us like hawks. Um, so uh, with that, let me recognize Councilmember Costa Constantinidis, who's joined us uh, from the committee, and uh, uh, see if Danny has any comments for this panel as well. Just to have one comment to um, Jennifer Hayashida to say, um, in that class, that was a class that was studying uh, Asian American history? It was, a, it was a course on Asian American literature and representations of citizenship, yeah. So because that's like students who are already probably some interest in Asian American history, and only five or ten of them out of the 30 would even know. I think the numbers in general education classes is probably even lower than that. I don't think I was ever taught this when I went through high school and learned this on my own. And that's really why I think this resolution is so vitally important because, um, you know, we need Americans to know, all Americans to know what happened to Fred Korematsu. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I, I, I would also like to add, if I may, that and I edited this paragraph out, but the thing that was most disturbing was students who came in with a complete misunderstanding, who thought that Japanese Americans were incarcerated for their own safety. Hmm. So. And thank you to CARE also for coming in, and everybody on the panel, but for, especially to CARE for making the connection between what's happening with our Muslim communities today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, can I really keep this book? Yeah. That's awesome, thank you. Of the um, University of Washington. Thank you very much. I will treasure it. Uh, thank you very much to this panel. Uh, very enlightening, and I hope everyone is um, learning along. Uh, so the second panel uh, uh, is first Yang Chen from the Asian American Bar Association, uh, Sharman uh, Sadeke, perhaps, Sharman? Apologies. Uh, David Okada from the Japanese American Citizens League. Um, Tanaya Izu, Tanaya, yep, and Christina Tasca from the Muslim Community Network. So we'll, uh, yep, uh, go right to left once again, um, not politically, only in terms of how you were sat, and uh, of ultimately, you want to end up on the left. Uh, uh, so uh, we'll start first with you. Again, two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Councilmember Von Bremer, for holding this hearing. And thank you, Councilmember Drum, for sponsoring resolution number 792. My name is Yang Chen, and I'm the executive director of the Asian American Bar Association of New York. We call ourselves Albany for short. Uh, I am honored to be here today. Uh, to testify on behalf of Albany in support of resolu resolution number 792 to establish January 30th annually as Fred T. Cormont today. Uh, Albany has been around since 1989. We're a nonprofit professional membership organization representing and promoting the interests of Asian Pacific American legal professionals in New York City and New York State. But we also advocate for the larger APA community of which we are a part and which in New York City numbers more than one million strong and stands as a vital part of the diverse fabric of New York City. Albany is an affiliate of NAPABA, the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, a nationwide group representing the interest of more than 50,000 APA attorneys across America. And Albany is one of NAPABA's largest affiliates in the country. And through NAPABA, Albany signed on to amicus briefs opposing the Muslim travel ban. Albany, through our Trout Reenactments Project, keeps alive the memory of Fred Korematsu and other Asian Pacific Americans who have suffered injustice, inequality, and deprivation of civil rights and human rights. Since 2007, we have produced and performed one trial reenactment a year of a famous legal case involving APAs as a way to teach lawyers and the general public about the significant but often forgotten contributions of APAs to American society and to the development of American law. The first reenactment was about Minyasui, who, like Fred Korematsu, challenged the lawfulness and constitutionality of Executive Order 9066 and suffered greatly throughout his life for it. We also enacted the Heart Mountain Draft resistors, case, resistors Cases, in which Japanese American attorneys challenged the legality and constitutionality of requiring them to be drafted to fight in World War II when they had been stripped of their rights as Americans. 
Uh, we have handed up uh, to, make, to be made part of the record those scripts. We would urge members of the council to perhaps pick up the scripts and perform it themselves. Uh, I want to say that next week in Washington, D.C., we are performing for the first time the Korematsu case as our next reenactment. And we're doing so to recognize that 2017 marks the 70th, 70th anniversary, 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066. And we do these reenactments simply because we must learn the lessons of history. And at this time in our history, it seems that we are slipping backwards and forgetting, forgetting the important lessons of history. And we urge the city council to stand up for what is right, to pass resolution number 792, so that January 30th, Fred Korematsu Day, will become a reality and serve as a constant reminder of the principles of equality, justice, civil rights, human rights, and due process enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and right behind my love of books is my love of theater. I am the chair of the Cultural Affairs and Libraries Committee, after all. And uh, uh, I think this is terrific. I love the power of theater and the arts uh, to uh, remind us of, of history and also make political statements. It reminds me of the Laramie Project, among other things. Uh, so why don't we uh, go to your right and my left? Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, Council Member Van Bremer and other members of the committee for holding this hearing and allowing the public to share our voices about Resolution 792. My name is Charmin Sadiqi, a member of the No Separate Justice Coalition. Um, we work around, uh, we work to, to support families who have been targeted by the United States in the war on terror under the pretext of, of national security. Um, we um, engage in public education programs about civil and human rights violations that Muslim American community is um, continue to face up until today. Um, as a member of a marginalized religious and racial community um, targeted by the state under the war on terror, my family has been directly impacted by this. I have a brother uh, imprisoned uh, whose uh, First Amendment rights have been violated by the federal agencies. Many American families that I work with um, as a member of the No Separate Justice and I personally know um, have, have um, been devastated as a result of these racist policies um, um, and, and by entrapment cases. Many American Muslims continue to be collectively blamed, racially and religiously profiled and imprisoned based on suspicion without any evidence of any wrongdoing. Japanese Americans, of course, have similarly faced um, these, these kind of, um, subjected to this kind of racist policies 65 years ago. I support the resolution 792 because I understand violating the dignity of human beings, collective blaming, collectively blaming groups, and imprisoning innocent people on manufactured suspicion as illiberal, regressive, undemocratic, and morally wrong. I urge the honorable members of this committee to pass the resolution so this day can be celebrated, but more importantly, so we can, we as a citizens can utilize the birth of Fred Karamatsu as opportunities to learn and educate people about human dignity and improve the social, political, and economic conditions of marginalized groups in this country. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next. Thank you, uh, committee, for uh, having us uh, provide our testimony. Um, I was, a, uh, I was born in an internment camp or incarceration center uh, in Minidoka. Uh, when I was born, it was a uh, harsh condition. It was like minus 20 degrees when my mother gave birth. So uh, there were entire barracks and one pot belly stove. That was it. Uh, I served in the military uh, in Vietnam. And I'm a veteran and participate in the American Legion as well as the um, Amer Japanese American Veterans Association. Um, my name is David Okada, and I represent the Japanese American Citizens League. And the reason I'm here today is because in this current administration, uh, the executive orders to ban immigrants is uh, a little frightening, and we don't want to repeat the uh, history of the Japanese American incarceration. In the wake of September 11, Fred Kodamatsu spoke out against the dangers of racial profiling the Arab Americans and urged U.S. leaders not to repeat the wrongs inflicted upon Japanese Americans. No one should be locked away simply because they share the same race, ethnicity, or religion as the spy or terrorist. If that principle is not learned from the internment of Japanese Americans, then these are very dangerous times for our democracy. 
He filed two amicus briefs with the Supreme Court on behalf of American Muslims being held at the notorious Guantanamo Bay prison. And basically he spoke about rounding up Arab and Muslim Americans and putting them in camps. You, you heard from Karen Kodamatsu, who mentioned that she has an educational center. We are concerned, as, uh, we are in favor of that as well. As a Japanese American Citizen League, we go out to schools to promote uh, Japanese American history and to uh, have them understand what transpired in the past. California marks the first Kuramatsu Day, uh, which was signed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, followed by the states of Hawaii, Virginia, and Florida. There are other resolutions in place, similar to 792 in Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Utah, that have submitted resolutions honoring the day, and South Carolina has submitted a bill to their legislator. So I thank the, the City Council for uh, hearing my testimony. Thank uh, Honorable um, Drum, Daniel Drum, for holding this hearing. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony and for your service. Uh, next. Um, hello, thank you for opening this hearing today. My name is Tanaya Izu, and I am a third and fourth generation Chinese and Japanese American from Oakland, California, living in Washington Heights. My pronouns are they and them. Designating January 30th as Korematsu Day would set a precedent for adults and children alike, teaching and reminding them that sweeping punitive measures targeting minorities, even when authorized and encouraged by the highest, off highest power in office, are wrong. In a political climate that prioritizes protecting serial rapists over seeking basic safety for transgender people, we need to recognize as heroes those who have had the enormous courage to stand up, often alone, to state violence, who refuse to budge at enormous cost to their freedom and safety when the state demand they shrink themselves. Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Chelsea Manning, the list goes on. Today there is increasing fear of speaking out. People like me and many of those in this room know that we are viewed as threats to the normative order of the U.S. We are marked as other and therefore become targets for hatred and fear both in policy and everyday practice. Meanwhile, white supremacists gather in mass unmolested to reclaim America as it should be, white, male, cisgender, bigoted. There's the same climate of fear, xenophobia, and bigotry that led to the scapegoating of 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry during World War II. In the retelling of incarceration stories, there is always emphasis on the fact, oops, on the fact that many were American citizens. What is overlooked is that those who are not citizens were legally denied citizenship because they were born in Japan and therefore ineligible for citizenship because of the xenophobic racist laws of the time. There are clear parallels between the fear of foreigners then and the fear of brown and black migrant workers and refugees today. As history has demonstrated, this was wrong. It continues to be wrong in the scapegoating of queer people, Muslim people, and all people of color for those bigoted insecurities and fears of those in power. America was never white, but it has always depended on the oppression of those deemed undesirable by the state, non-whites, women, queers, immigrants, refugees, poor people, etc. Designating January 30th as Korematsu Day will remind children and adults alike that necessity of standing up to what is wrong, even if it seems they stand alone. It will send a strong message that yes, we too are America, we have been America, we are what America will look like. We need to recognize more heroes like Fred Korematsu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Councilmember Drummond and I are both of, uh, part of the LGBT community, so I appreciate you uh, bringing in um, and uh, paying respect to Marsha Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, uh, who I once shared a jail cell with um, after we committed an act of civil disobedience. Um, Last but not least on this panel. Good afternoon. My name is Christina Tosca. I'm the executive director of the Muslim Community Network, a nonprofit organization that builds civic leadership and cultivates compassion and understanding amongst diverse multi-faith communities of New York City. On behalf of MCN, I would like to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to the Committee of Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations for officially establishing the Fred T. Korematsu Day. And a special thank you to Councilmember Drum and Chair Van Bremer and the other council members who are championing this cause and see the value in the establishment of, NY of this day for New Yorkers to remember a dark time in our history. The incarceration of 120,000 American citizens based solely on their heritage remains a dark, glaring stain on our nation's history. 
During World War II, Japanese Americans were profiled, abused, and relocated far from home in internment camps where they faced human rights abuses, starvation, neglect, and were stripped of their rights. We now live in a time where we see reflections of a period that we should never revisit. As a Muslim American, I have borne witness to my own faith communities and other communities facing similar infringements on civil rights and liberties for no other reasons than fear, ignorance, and political gain. Our elected leaders have the responsibility towards the care and protection of all of their constituents, regardless of their heritage, national origin, race, faith, gender, or any other identification which may be exploited to marginalize and oppress them. What we do here in New York City has ripple effects across the country. The establishment of this day is a testimony to Fred Korematsu's courage and conviction to rise against bigotry and fear-mongering at the highest level. It is an act of honoring what it means to be an American. Let us today set the example for our nation by establishing January 30th as Fred T. Korematsu Day, a day to commemorate the value of our civil, liberty, civil liberties and U.S. Constitution. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your testimony uh, to uh, this entire uh, panel. And uh, Councilmember Member Drum. Just very, quick, just very quickly, also want to thank the panel for coming in and to point out, um, you know, how uh, Mayor LaGuardia and Earl Warren, uh, in particular, uh, cracked down on LGBT people as well as Japanese people, and uh, how we see similarities today. And I think it was this panel that brought the play, right? I'm getting a little, yeah, okay. So in the, in the timeline of events on the, on the first page, it's very similar almost to the timeline of events that's happening here today in the United States of America as well, especially with the issuance of proclamations and executive orders. So it is, in fact, very, very frightening to see what's going on uh, in light of even just looking at this material that you presented. So thank you for that, and I will read it. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, to this panel, and uh, I'm going to call the names of this next panel, but uh, there is a delegation of council members going to Puerto Rico uh, for relief efforts. I'm a member of that delegation, and there is a meeting downstairs right now about that that I have to attend, so council member Drum will um, uh, preside uh, for the next uh, two panels. Uh, so again, we have uh, on this next panel, Rosella Clyde, is Rosella Clyde here, uh, Andy Kim, Andy Kim, uh, looks like Steve Goldberg, Steve Goldberg, Julie Azuma, Julie, yes, and Debbie Amontasser. Okay, I guess we will start again on the right and go to the left. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rosella Clyde, and I am the Educational Director of Kaleidoscope Educational Consultants. From 2007 to 2011, I was the president of the Association of Teachers of Social Studies, ATSS UFT. And I'm here basically to um, thank uh, Councilman Drum for picking up this initiative and moving this initiative forward. I think that, the, that New York City needs Resolution 792 now more than ever for all the reasons that have already been stated. But I'd like to call attention to the seventh whereas paragraph, which deals with the Federal Commission on Wartime Relocation and Interment of Civilians concluding that the executive order 9066 was not justified by military necessity and the decisions which followed it from it. Detention, ending detention, ending exclusion were not driven by analysis of military conditions, but instead by 
race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. And as the councilman has reiterated several times today, I think that we stand at a rather parallel point in time when the word sanctuary city has become a negative term. I also want to point to the fact that as an educator, it is extremely important to anchor dates. So by having the date January 30th as an anchor date, it provides an opportunity for educators to place this experience in context and in time. And that's extremely important with all the conflicting um, responsibilities that, ed that educators are faced with today. By having this particular date um, and having this date uh, um, connected with the importance of Fred Korematsu's birthday, it provides a, a tremendous opportunity for us to move forward with this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And yes, as I'm being a former teacher myself, I know that this will be very helpful to teachers to zero in on that date and to uh, look for curriculum around, uh, around the issue. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Andy Kim, and I am a second year JD candidate at New York University School of Law and Korematsu Chair of our Asian Pacific American Law Students Association. I'm honored to testify today in support of the establishment of Fred T. Korematsu Day in our city. My role with the APA Law Students Association is to organize NYU's annual Korematsu Lecture. The lecture series was established in 2000 in honor of Fred Korematsu, and it provides a forum to address Asian American perspectives on the law and to honor those who have substantially contributed to the legal profession while challenging status quo racism and injustice. We have hosted many distinguished jurists in the years, including professors Harold Koh and Kenji Yoshino, Judge Pamela Chen of the Eastern District of New York, and most recently, Judge Jacqueline Wen of the Ninth Circuit. During much of Fred Korematsu's life, it would have been hard to imagine such talented and accomplished Asian Americans in the law. Is it, it is a terrible burden to be the first in anything, but as law students, we have the incredible blessing to stand on treaded ground, albeit lightly. The lecture series serves as a reminder of the progress we have made, not just as Asian Americans, but as a civil society. But Korematsu's name also reminds us that civil liberties are not to be taken for granted. They must be fought for. This was the case in 1942. It was the case in 2001. And unfortunately, it remains the case in 2017. The 1944 Supreme Court decision that bears Korematsu's name has never been overturned. While it is widely discredited, it is a reminder to remain ever vigilant. Fred Korematsu fought for his constitutional rights long after he had served out his sentence. He had nothing material to gain and acted simply on the principle of justice. He and Gordon Hirabayashi and Minoru Yasui just knew that what had happened to them and their loved ones was unconstitutional and even un-American. I hope that New York City will join us in remembering Fred Korematsu, but more importantly, what he stands for in civil liberties and our Constitution. In establishing Fred D. Korematsu Day, I look forward to, to joining the growing numbers of cities and states that celebrate January 30th accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. <clears throat> I'm Steve Goldberg. In former life, I was an attorney. Now I'm a history grad student at Brooklyn College. Um, as an attorney, in reading the Korematsu decision, it's a total abomination. And I must say that even if the military had allowed in the evidence to show that the decision was not necessary, the internment wasn't necessary, it wouldn't have mattered. The court would have deferred to the military's judgment anyway, incorrectly, but that's what they would have done. Why did Frankfurter sign it? I think, in studying the matter, that Frankfurter signed it because he was a very prominent Jew on the court. There were still allegations from anti-Semites in the US saying that this was a Jewish war, that the Jews were forcing FDR to fight the Germans and the Japanese. As such, Frankfurter may have felt compelled to show there were no dual loyalties, that he was going with the military. And if that's the case, and I think it probably is, he got it wrong. He could have made a much stronger statement by saying he supports American values. And those values are what we're fighting for, and that's what motivates us. And that would have been better in 1942. It would have been better in 1944. 
It would have been better in 2001. It would be better today. I thank you very much. Thank you. Next, please. Hi. I'm Julia Zuma. I'm a third-generation Japanese-American. My parents applied to be released early from Tule Lake concentration camp in 1943 so that I could be born later that year in Chicago without the stigma of camp. My parents were part of the resettlers group in Chicago, an endearing name for people who had lost their livelihood through their incarceration and had to move away from the West Coast. I was born on the south side of Chicago, uh, where my parents' uh, family both all came to live with us. Together, they all started a new life. As a young child in the family, the entire family chose not to tell me about camp. They kept it a secret. Um, it, imagine the shame, humiliation, and shared suffering that caused them to keep the experience hidden. They wanted me to remain hidden and innocent of the injustices done to them. This happened to all of my childhood friends back then, else we would have learned from each other. I didn't learn about the uh, concentration camps until I was 13 when I put it together and went to the public library. I went through childhood trying to figure out what the mystery of the uh, camp experience, and it took three decades before uh, the redress movement started. Um, after I moved to New York, I found the redress movement here in New York in the early, late 70s, early 80s, and there was a real catharsis in the community. Through the Regis movement, I learned what happened to the families of all the Japanese American from the West Coast. I always wondered why we didn't stand up for our constitutional rights, but I can now see a community full of pride wanted this humiliating ch chapter of their lives hidden away. The uh, camp experience reshaped an entire community, their sense of selves, their confidence, in many ways overt and subtle, and through the generations. So it's important us to, for us to have a day named after Fred Korematsu. It's irrelevant for the country to have a shared moment when we can stand together and remember the tragic time when racism created a loss of our collective freedom and damaged our civil liberties. It will be a reminder for all of us not to let it happen again to any group. Thank you. Thank you. Also, next please. Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Peace and greetings. My name is Dr. Debbie Almentasser. I am offering um, testimony on behalf of the Yemeni American Merchants Association, an organization that was birthed out of the Yemeni bodega strike on February 2nd of 2017 against the Muslim ban. It is my honor to be here on behalf of them, as well as a Yemeni American and Muslim American woman in New York City. First, I want to applaud and thank the Committee of the Cultural Affairs Libraries, the International Intergroup Relations, for officially considering to establish the Fred Korematsu Day, a day to, commemor sorry, a day to commemorate the value of our civil liberties and the U.S. Constitution that we hold dear on January 30th of each year. Also, a special thanks to Council Member uh, Drum and all of his colleagues for seeing the value to, to the establishment of this day for New Yorkers to remember a dark history in our, a dark day in our history and to say never again. Fred Korematsu courageously fought the U.S. government and the U.S. Supreme Court for the incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. His courage gives Muslim Americans and I the courage to stand up to the travel ban that, is created to, that was created to target Muslim-majority countries. The establishment of this day is not just about the accomplishments or actions of one man, but is a highly symbolic acknowledgement of how racially and religiously motivated policies can infringe on our basic civil and human rights, which are morally wrong. The time we are living in carries a tinge of the treatment of Japanese Americans during the World War II, where they were rejected, profiled, abused, neglected, and displaced due to the fact they were Japanese. The scare tactics used to justify the travel ban are the exact scare tactics used right here today under this administration. At our nation's current state is a reflection of this power then and the fact it is happening in the 21st century is alarming. The current administration has caused a great deal of insecurity for Muslims, blacks, immigrants, Mexicans, LGBTQIA communities, and women. As a nation, we should not be turning back on the dark times of our history where exclusion propaganda and fear-mongering 
dictated policies. This resolution speaks for all marginalized communities who are easily targeted when the political tide turns against them. The continued mass incarcerations, racial profiling, separation of immigrant families, the ban of Muslim majority countries, and the contemplation of a Muslim registry as promised by the U.S. Commander in Chief are unacceptable. The abuse of power in our nation and the violation of our civil liberties are beyond belief. As a nation recognized by the world as the land of the free and the land that welcomes immigrants with open arms, we have earned a reputation of exclusion and bigotry. We must learn from our past and say never again. We can no longer remain silent. Our silence is a psychological violence. At this moment in time, we must defend and protect our civil rights to live with respect and dignity. So today, let us change the course of our city by establishing January 30th as Fred Korematsu Day, a day to commemorate the value of our civil liberties and the U.S. Constitution, which we all hold near and dear. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amantasa. And uh, thank you for mentioning all the council members that are included on this. We actually have 35 council members, which is a veto-proof majority on this. And um, I'm sure that council member Van Bremer will be bringing this forward for a vote uh, because I know that he's also very interested in these social justice issues. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to just ask um, Mr. Zuma about the family hiding uh, the fact of the internment and um, the shame that it caused. Can you elaborate a little bit further on that? Uh, to this day, I have a hard time asking my family about what happened to them during that period of time. Um, they, did, they would talk about camp, and when you'd say, what happened? Where, why were you at summer camp without me? Which is what I thought. Most of us did think that. Uh, they would just say, you, don't, you know, it's, it's nothing. It's not, not, none of your business. Or they, it, was, it was a really darkly held secret for, for as long as I could remember. Even as I worked on redress, it was hard to ask them directly what their experiences were. That had that much of an impact on them. I think the impact, impact I could see in their children and their children's children mm -hmm. that were still retiring. You know, I, uh, I watched her go beyond time and I was still on time <laughs> because I was afraid. That, that kind of fear of authority is, is part of that, that uh, lack of confidence is something that happened during that internment. Well, certainly sharing your personal story uh, has a very strong impact. And uh, that's why I wanted to ask you about it, because, uh, you know, hearing that, I think, really makes a difference. Thank you. And uh, finally, let me just ask also, um, uh, Mr. Andy Kim, um, what would it take to overturn the decision in the Supreme Court? I mean, would somebody have to go back? I don't know the law. How would that happen? Would you have to go back to the Supreme Court and have them overturn it? Is that even a possibility? I believe so, but it's... It's, in terms of the scholarship on the matter, it has already been addressed in how um, this type of precedent is very fraught when it comes to both the law, but also the facts, especially when it came out um, on exactly what type of facts the case itself rested on. Um, I, I cannot speak more on the matter, unfortunately. So would we lose um, any of the historical importance if it was to be overturned? There's, there's no. Some, uh, when, Excuse I, me? Uh, one time I asked a very ignorant question in a, in a hearing about the Constitution on the um, two-thirds person, which one class this is? The slave people. Oh, three-fifths three clause. Yeah, the clause of the Constitution. And there were those who argued, you know, that, well, first of all, you know, it can't really be overturned, but then do we really want to, or do we want to use that as a lesson for history? And I'm just wondering what your sentiment is on that. Right. Um, having a case like this overturned would not diminish the historical significance of having so many Japanese Americans interned. The case itself stands as a record of how the government was and the, the judiciary was so complicit in allowing this uh, awful event to happen. And I, I really cannot say that a court's action could take away that history 
for my country. Okay, well, I, I thank you all again for coming thank in, you. and um, we're going to call up the next panel. Thank you. Okay, now we have uh, Sophia Zhang from CACF, Hunter High School. Lu Rou. Yao. Sorry. Yao oh. O. Very hard for me to read these also. The print is very small. Uh, from um, LaGuardia. College, in College International High School. Juning Ao. Um, from CACF, High School Language and Innovation. Shahana Abdeen, High School Construction Trade. And Andy Kai, Stuyvesant High School. And I do apologize uh, for... And Mitch Wu. And Mitch, and Mitch Wu. Bring, bring them all up. But you know, I need a slip on them, um, Mr. Wu. So if they could fill out a slip w before they speak, that would be great. You can sit, sit them, seat them, and then yes, and then we'll get the slip. Uh, they've turned it in? And so then we're, we have uh, Nada Alnandra, Brooklyn Tech High School, Kai Ying Guo, LaGuardia High School, and Mitchell Wu. Mr. Wu, is everybody there? Yes. Okay, very good. So um, would you like to start for us? All right, thank you very much. My name is Mitchell Wu, and I'm the Director of Programs of the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, CACF. CACF would like to first thank Committee Chair Van Brammer and other members of the committee um, to hold this important hearing on Resolution 792, as well as a thank you for the sponsor of the resolution, Council Member Drum. CACF is the nation's only pan-Asian children's advocacy organization. Our mission is to prove the health and well-being of Asian Pacific American APA children and families. And I'm just going to use APA for short for the rest of my testimony for the sake of time. There is a long history of APAs in this country, with the first documentation of APAs in America as early as the 1570s and settlement as early as the 1760s. In New York City, APAs are, by percentage, the fastest growing racial community, doubling every decade since 1970, constituting over 15% of the overall population, speaking over 40 languages and dialects from approximately 100 different regions of origin. Now, despite this rapid population growth and diversity, APAs often face invisibility or very little representation in various fields such as media and in history textbooks. Out of the over 1 million APAs in New York City, one out of two APA children are born into poverty. 78% of APAs are foreign born and 28% speak little or no English. These statistics indicate deeper and more complex issues in the community when it comes to barriers of acculturation, community development, and access to resources. By taking a deeper look in our community, one can see that APAs are not a monolithic, quote unquote, model minority group. APA youth now, also face significant barriers in school. According to the New York City Department of Education, one out of five APA children do not graduate on time or at all from high school. 50% of APAs in New York State are not considered college ready when they do finish high school. And that number is actually higher in urban concentration like New York City. APA youth uh, face many challenges such as language and cultural barriers, having to take on extra responsibilities both financially and domestically for their families and schools and face bullying, microaggressions, and a lack of support when it comes to culturally competent services. Um, CACF actually have a youth leadership program for high school youth from all across five boroughs. We actually brought them here today. They actually traveled very far um, to also show their personal testimonies on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before we go to the others, I just want to thank you personally for helping to make this uh, hearing happen and for all the work that you did to get uh, co-sponsors onto the legislation. Uh, so I'm very grateful to you. Yeah, we're grateful to you as well for, the, for the being the late sponsor. We're very happy to help and excited to be here. Thank you. Next, please. Hello. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kai Ying Guo. I'm a senior at LaGuardia High School of the Arts, and I'm here as a representative from the Asian American Student Advocacy Project, ASAP. 
We are a citywide youth leadership program under the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, CACF. Uh, I would like to thank Committee Chair Van Bramer and the members of the Committee of Cultural Affairs for holding this important hearing on Resolution 0792. I was born in a small suburban town in southern China. Shortly after I turned five, my parents and I came to America. This I've been here ever since then. This city is my childhood and this country is my home. My high school is often cited to have a great cultural diversity that is reflective of the city's melting pot nature. Um, Asian Pacific Americans, APA students, make up more than 20% of my student population, but APA history is hardly taught or mentioned. On occasions when APA history is mentioned, it is oversimplified or served to students like side dishes. In my history class last year, nearly a quarter of my classmates were APA. However, few of us participated in discussions because of an apparent disconnect. My APA peers and I felt alienated within our own classroom because we couldn't find a piece of ourselves within what was being taught. In the back of our heads, while we learned about war and slavery, we kept thinking, well, where were the Asian Americans? What was, where, would I, where would I have fit in all of this? I felt like an anomaly because of my ethnic background, as if my education was confirming the stereotype that APAs are perpetually foreigners and that we've played minimal, if any, part in creating this country. I think establishing Fred Cormont today will encourage the much needed conversation in classrooms about Asian Pacific Americans in American history. Korematsu's fight will bring awareness to the unequal treatment and the exclusion of Asian Americans in nearly all of American history, from policies to forms of social institutions. I deeply regret not knowing about Fred Korematsu in my childhood. His legacy helped me connect to this country in a way that gave me courage to speak today at this hearing. His deeds not only inform us of the struggles and accomplishments of the APA community and this country, but also of what it means to take essential American values and put them into action. I believe Fred Korematsu's valuable experience has something every New Yorker can, can take away from. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Nada Alnagar. I am a member of the Asian American Student Advocacy Project. I'm a sophomore at Brooklyn Technical High School, and I would like to thank Chairperson Van Bramer for holding this important hearing on Resolution 0792. As someone who is half Asian American, I never felt like my Asian identity was an important one because I was in America for the majority of my life. I learned about the expeditions of so many bold explorers, war heroes, and advocates of social change, and never an Asian American one. Without learning about the Asian American history, I would not feel connected to that part of my identity. I didn't know anything about the history of... Um, of Asian Americans like me, and I never thought to explore it because they were never mentioned in school, meaning I was unaware of the significance of Asian American figures like Fred Karamatsu. Similarly, Asian Americans in my high school who make up 60% of the population are just as unaware about Asian American history. I'm sure many students in the New York City public school system feel the same way. This is why we need to learn about the significance of figures like Fred Korematsu. He is a role model of what Asian Americans truly are in America and what every Asian American should strive for. He fought against racial profiling and was a civil rights activist his entire life. By incorporating Fred Korematsu in their curriculum, students begin seeing how Asian Americans, one of the many marginalized communities, has contributed to this country. Learning about American history through multiple perspectives can help students like me connect with their curriculum and their racial identity. I wish someone told me that my Asian American identity was one to be explored and learned to the utmost. I want to learn more about the empowerment and struggles of Asian Pacific Americans in American history so I can engage in my community like Fred Korematsu did and feel more empowered because I can advocate and create positive change too. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Andy Kai, and I am a senior at Stuyvesant High School. I'm here as a student leader from the Asian American Student Advocacy Project, ASAP. We would like to thank Chairperson Van Bramer and the members of the committee for holding this important hearing on Resolution 792. There's a stereotype that all Asian Pacific Americans, APAs, are foreigners. Many people assume that we all co came from Asia. A common experience many, many Asian Americans, including myself, share is someone asking where we are really from. In middle school, I remember going to the park to play basketball. After playing for a while, one of the people watching came up to me and said, hey, you play pretty well for an Asian. Where are you from? I told him I was from Bressonhurst. He said, I mean, where are you really from? I didn't understand what he meant. He said, like, are you from Japan, China, Korea? 
I responded that I was born in New York and I had never been to Asia before. He looked confused. He had this expectation that I immigrated to the U.S. People don't think that APAs have been in America for long. He had this misconception that APAs are not truly American, but rather they're just here in America. I had this type of interaction so many times, I started to question those whether or not I was actually American. They refused to accept the answer that I was from Brooklyn, New York. I thought that there couldn't be any way that so many people were mistaken. I started to think I was the one who was wrong. However, after I learned about what Fred Korematsu did, it became clear to me that APAs are an important part of America. Whenever people hear the term Asian American or Japanese American, they tend to focus on the first part, the non-American part. People often forget or ignore that we are also Americans. Fred Korematsu is an APA who definitely acted as an American citizen. He did what I think is the most American thing. When his rights were being violated by the executive order, he stood up against the unjust rules. Japanese Americans were being sent to internment camps without a trial. This violated the Fifth Amendment rights, which states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Fred Kamasu's story made me realize that APA are not only Americans, but also an important part of America. I wish I had learned about Fred Kamasu earlier. I didn't learn about Fred Kamasu in school. It wasn't until I joined ASAP that I heard Kamasu's story. When I finally did learn about Korematsu, I was surprised by what APAs, APAs have done for this country. I wish Fred Korematsu's story is taught in school so others won't have the same identity crisis I did. Thank you all again for holding this hearing. Thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon. My name is Shahana Abdin, and I am a junior at High School for Construction Trades, Engineering, and Architecture. I am here as a representative from ASAP, and I would like to thank the committee chair and the committee for holding this hearing on Resolution 0792. I am a Muslim Bangladeshi American. I am an American, and no matter what others may say or assume, I will always remain an American. Many people are discriminated against due to their beliefs, race, and or ethnic background, which ne negatively impacts them and leads them to feel fearful and helpless as if they are not accepted by their fellow citizens. Knowing you are an American and feeling like, a, like an outcast in your own country is terrible. Korematsu, like many minorities, felt a need to fit in to be perceived as more American. At one point, he underwent eye surgery, eye surgery to look less foreign. He also took upon a new identity by changing his name and pretending to be of another ethnic, ethnic background. Korematsu, however, eventually realized that he was proud of his ethnic ethnicity and accepted it with pride. He sets a great example for others. He shows that one should be proud of who they are, that they should not change themselves in order to fit in and to please others. Only a portion of minorities stand up for their rights because the majority don't feel like they fit in. They don't feel like they have a say in their country, causing a lack of representation, and the few that do take a stance and try to make a difference are underrepresented and by, the, by the media and the education system. There have been many biases this past year towards minorities, especially Muslims, with the creation of the Muslim ban. Being banned from the country due to beliefs is a clear violation of the Constitution and the foundation of America. It is a difficult time for minorities. They need to be provided with hope. They need to be shown that they belong and that they are accepted. Celebrating and honoring Fred Korematsu would be a great way to provide hope not only to Japanese Americans, but all communities. He is a national, rights hero, national, national civil rights hero who supported and stood up for Japanese Americans when they were being incarcerated during World War II. He also stood up for the rights of many others after 9-11, many Muslims were being mistreated. He spoke out against this mistreatment. For example, in 2004, a Muslim American was being held in solitary confinement without trial, so he filed a brief with the Supreme Court. With everything that is going on today, it is imperative to showcase and celebrate a person who helps accepts and advocates for everyone rather than discriminates against us and sees us as, as inferior. Korematsu is a great example of a person who stands up for the rights of all Americans, and it is crucial, crucial especially to, right now, to have good role models and examples that provide hope for all communities. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to have the next group of students coming up. Uh, Steve Levin, uh, Councilmember Steve Levin has joined us as well. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Good afternoon. My name is Junning Chen. I'm, I'm a member from Asian, uh, Asian American Student Advocacy Project, ASAP. And I will thank committee chair Wan Bremer and members of Community Cultural Affairs to hold this important hearing on Resolution 792. I'm, 
I'm an English language learner and a current senior in the International High School at Lawadia Community College, which is in District, district 26. To help Fred Kumasu, they can help us to feel the connection to this country, encourage us to learn, and to build self-confidence, and to make us think we are represented, we are one part of this country. Most of the students in my high school and in my neighborhood are new immigrants who are English language learners. We don't speak English very well. We feel that we are not connected to this country, and many of us are afraid to speak English in public. We're even afraid to order food in McDonald's. In New York State, the overall high school graduation rate is about 78%, but for English language learners, it's only 37%. When I studied history in my school, I didn't learn anything about Asian American history. I didn't know there is something called Asian American history. The only time I learned something about Asian American is in my English class. We learn about Japanese American concentration camps. We read, two we read two articles and some pictures. We go through this very quickly without deeper discussion about the issue. But Asian American has deeper roots in this country, just like Fred Kumasu's story. Before I joined ASAP, I didn't know anything about him, who he is, what he did, and why he is important. But now he has become my role model. His, his spirit of not afraid of power, the courage to tell something is not right, really inspired me. Now I'm not afraid to speak in public, and I feel the connection to this country, and I'm a part of this country. Thank you again for holding this important hearing and giving me this opportunity to testify. Next. Hello everyone, my name is Lu Yao. I was born in China and I came here one year ago. I am a current sophomore in High School of Language and Innovation in the Bronx. I am also a youth leader of Asian American Student Advocacy Project ASAP. Thank you again, Committee Chair Van Bremer and the members of Committee of Culture Affairs for holding this hearing on Resolution 792 so that I have this opportunity to testify for Fred Korimasu. My high school is a diverse school for new immigrants. Majority of my school are Latino. In fact, Asian Americans like me are the minority in my school. My classmates think I am so smart and I should know everything. If I am confused about question, they will be very surprised. Every time when we mention to China or other Eastern Asian countries, my, class my classmates will look at me and they usually say ching chang to make fun of me. It makes me so upset and angry. I try to ignore them, but I still can hear them. Even when I'm not in the school, I still experience things that makes me very uncomfortable. In the subway, a group of children talked about where I am from in front of me loudly. They said something rude about my community to their friends, and I, and I heard those. I want to get rid of this stereotype, and I want to say, I'm not your model minority. I think this situation happened in many Asian Americans' life because people don't know enough about our community. Having first Curry Mouse Day on January 30th will make more and more students, children, and adults be knowledgeable about the diverse culture in America. In addition, studying Asian American history helps people be better understand and respect each other's community. Learning about the history of Fred Karamasu enforces people that we are also part of America. Also, there will be less bullying and the racism there. Thank you again for holding this hearing. Thank you very much uh, for your very powerful testimony. Did you say you came from China one year ago? Oh, uh, yeah. Wow. That's amazing, and you're already here at City Hall. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the White House cannot be far behind. Uh, thank you, and, and uh, hearing your testimony was, of course, somewhat painful to hear some of the experiences that you're having, but um, uh, I want to say thank you for telling the story, sharing the story, and, and for being here. It's very, very powerful that you're here. Thank you so much. Next. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Su Hui Zhen. You can call me Sophia. I'm a member of Asian American Student Advocacy Project, ASAP, and a junior at Manhattan Hunter Science High School, which is represented by Council Member Helen Rosendo. I would like to thank Committee Chair Van Bremer and members of the Committee of Cultural Affairs for holding this important hearing on Resolution 792. I immigrated here one year and a half ago from China. 
At first, I didn't consider myself as part of America, especially when most immigrants around me also see ourselves as foreigners. But when I saw many Asian Pacific American, or APA, were indifferent about most social issues, this strongly conflicted with my strong sense of social responsibility that teenagers should have. I realized why there is low participation of APA in politics, even though APA have long-term rules in America. We should have a role model to look up to. After learning about Frickel Mosul's inspiring experience of fighting for civil rights in hard condition, I became firmly believe that I am a part of America. I became more aware of that I have civil rights like others in the country, and I should always speak out like any, for any unfairness instead of being silent. Additionally, in all of my time in high school, which is very diverse, I noticed that my teacher never talked about APA history, and there were no materials distributed on. Sometimes I feel more left out, and I know that there are so many APA students feeling the same way. I truly believe that we cannot fully understand American history without learning about APA history, because it is vital since we were rooted here for hundreds of years and took part in constructing this country. Establishing African Muscle Day is the bridge between APA communities and other ethnic groups because knowing the day will make people to talk and learn more about APA culture. As we want students who want the future to be more cosmopolitan, it is critical to inform them all aspects of different cultures. Es Establishing African Muscle Day is not just help the APA community, but all New Yorkers can all learn from him about the courage and the civil rights that we should have in order to avoid the repetition of history. Thank you all again for having the hearing. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, all three of you. Um, we're very proud to, uh, to have you here and uh, thrilled with your participation. Um, incredibly impressive panel. Councilmember Jones, do you have anything to add? No, just to say that I am always impressed by ASAP. They do a wonderful job um, connecting the youth with uh, their history and uh, getting them involved in city council hearings and getting them to know uh, city government. So thank you to all of the ASAP youth who were here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now we have uh, two more panels. Um, looks like Kim Ima, uh, Takeshi Furumoto, I think I'm seeing that right, and Elizabeth Oyang. Those three, and then there's one final panel after that of three. Careful, careful. Okay. Uh, my name is Kim Ima. I'm a fourth generation Japanese American. I just kicked my father out of my seat. He didn't hear correctly. He's in the next panel. Oh, okay. Um, and I, he was a child in the camps. Uh, so I'm a daughter of a child of the camps. Would you like to testify together? Is that? Um, it's okay. 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 Um, uh, I am here on behalf of the New York Day of Remembrance Committee. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank you so much for having this hearing today. Uh, the New York Day of Remembrance Committee was uh, a part of bringing the Commission on Wartime Relocation of Civilians to New York in 1981 to hear the testimony of Japanese Americans from the West Coast, but also Japanese American New Yorkers who were wrongfully imprisoned during World War II in their homes and on and uh, on, at Ellis Island. And the findings of that commission, uh, which where hearings were nationwide, was published in the report Personal Justice Denied. And in that report, the causes of this chapter of history were uh, characterized as being uh, caused by racism, war hysteria, and the failure of political leadership. New York City, in many areas has been a role model to the world as a city that embraces a civil society. And 
even though Mayor LaGuardia opposed the resettlement of Japanese Americans in New York City after World War II, um, our city is and always has been a beacon in, a time, in times that need many lights to shine fiercely against the darkness of hate and bigotry. 75 years ago, 75 years since the Japanese American incarceration, when we find political surrogates of the Trump administration calling for Muslim registries, and was, when ICE raids are being conducted on immigrant communities, we must stop to consider the parallels to World War II, when Japanese Americans were singled out, registered, rounded up, stripped of their rights, and targeted with similarly racial, racially motivated policies. Our community knows well the dangers of racism, war hysteria, war hysteria and the failure of political leadership. I just want to add that Mr. Korematsu is a national hero for standing up to injustice in his time, and his story of resistance and courage resonate hope and are the cause for celebration and honest reflection in a time when we all uh, need to reflect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next. My name is Tak Furumoto. Is the microphone on, the little red light? There you go. Yeah, thank you. My name is Tak Furumoto, and I was born in Two Lake Segregation Center. I thought it was appropriate to wear my combat uniform that I wore 50 years ago, 1970-71, while our chief, commander-in-chief, was nursing his bone spurs, but my experience is a little bit different. We went back to Japan, and we were told never to come back again. We dare not. We came back. It took us four years. One by one, my parents could not come in, come back, because automatically they lost their citizenship. But us kids, we had it, and we came back to dream the American dream. I would like to say that patriotism has many forms, defending the country, or like Fred Korematsu, who believe in the Constitution. That is patriotism. I want to read a letter that I got from President Clinton, apology letter, so uncanny, it is so similar to what's happening today. Just part because I'm given time limitation. Why don't you go ahead and read the whole letter? Okay. White House, Washington, October 1st, 1993. Over 50 years ago, the United States government unjustly, in turn, evacuated or relocated you and many other Japanese Americans. Today, on behalf of your fellow Americans, I offer sincere apology to you for, for actions that unfairly deny Japanese Americans and their families fundamental liberties only World War II. In passing the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, we acknowledge the wrongs of the past and offer redress to those who endure such, such grave injustice. In retrospect, we understand that the nation's actions were rooted deeply in racial discrimination, wartime hysteria, and lack of political leadership. We definitely lack political leadership today. We must learn from the past and dedicate ourselves as a nation to renewing that spirit of equality and love of freedom. Together, we can guarantee a future with liberty, justice for all. You and your family have best wishes for the future. We must preserve, not don't let the Korematsu's years in prison or our internment for years. Let that be the last one. We must preserve our Constitution. Thank you very much.
thank you for being here. Thank you for your service. Thank you for uh, your story and for sharing uh, your passionate statements with us. Uh, and uh, I can assure you that this city council uh, will will pass this resolution that we support um, uh, everything behind it. Uh, and uh, you know, may it go a long way towards. Uh, uh, informing the 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 head of our government right now in in Washington, uh, who may have less appreciation um, for all of this, but thank you very much. And last but not least, on this panel, I support January thirtieth, the day Fred T. Korematsu was born, as Fred T. Korematsu Day. Today is my birthday. And of the 57 birthdays I've celebrated, today is the most meaningful one to celebrate my freedom and civil liberties by being here today. For the past 30 years, I have been a civil rights attorney. And for the past 16 years, I have taught at Columbia and New York universities. I teach a pre-law course, Constitution and Communities of Color and a course on post 9-11 policies impacting immigrants. Korematsu versus United States is a landmark Supreme Court case we cover each year, along with Judge Patel's decision 40 years later, overturning his wartime conviction. Judge Patel stated, as a legal precedent, it is now recognized as having very limited application. Unfortunately, since September 11, 2011, 2001, the misguided policies of exclusion, removal, and detention based on discriminating identifiers have only become more intensified in the past 16 years. What was rampant racial and ethnic profiling of Japanese Americans during World War II is rampant and unrelenting religious and ethnic profiling of Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians today. Our country needs to be reminded of the human consequences of these vagrant, unconstitutional atrocities, especially now. The remaining survivors of Japanese American internment are a dying generation. Declaring January 30th Fred T. Korematsu Day is a permanent reminder that in times of war or declared military necessity, our institutions must be vigilant in protecting constitutional guarantees. And our young children must have heroes that look like Fred Korematsu. Earlier this month, I was giving a talk to fifth graders at PS 130 on what legacy means. To prepare, I asked my eight-year-old nephew, Timothy, of famous people he knew that he had died. He cited Martin Luther King, Amelia Earhart, and George Washington. When I asked him about famous Asian Americans who had died, Timothy said he didn't know any. Having a day specifically set aside to honor Fred Korematsu will cause these young people to ask, who was he? And Fred Korematsu is a role model for all. By memorializing January 30th as Fred T. Korematsu Day, it will serve as a reminder that persons of Asian ancestry can be American. It will be a reminder that resistance to unlawful policies that defy our constitutional guarantees of equality and due process is our civic duty. And it will be an unequivocal reaffirmation that New York City, whose mayor at the time did not want released Japanese internees to relocate to the Big Apple, welcomes all ethnicities, including persons of Japanese ancestry. Thank you, Councilman Drum and Chairman Van Brummer. And we hope that this, um, you will take it to committee vote as soon as possible. So on January 30th, 2018, we can celebrate Fred T. Korematsu Day. Thank you very much, and happy birthday. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, to you. You got extra time because it's your birthday. Um, I took it. As my, my gift. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Furumoto, I, I, I took the liberty of reading uh, the rest of your, your testimony and some of your life story in here, which you didn't get a chance to say, but uh, uh, it's incredible. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you to this panel. Um, and uh, I will, in fact, call your father now, uh, uh, Mr. Ima, who uh, came up earlier. Uh, now uh, would be the appropriate time. And I think it's Joseph. What's that? That's it. Pedoriano? Great. It doesn't look like that on the paper, but I'm going to trust you because it's your last name. Um, come up to the panel. And I think this is the last person who's uh, registered. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, is it Tony Choi? Yes. You got right up when I said your name. Okay. And I think that's it uh, for the testimony. So why don't we hear from Mr. Ima first, and uh, out of respect, and then uh, the two of you can go after that. My name is, uh, my name is Kenji Ima Yanagita. Uh, at four years of age, I was incarcerated in Minidoka, Block 36, Barrack 6, Room D. That's just impressed in my mind, 366D. Now, I am the only one left in my family with the camp experience. And at four years of age, I wondered, what could I say? But it turns out that no one else in my family is left except me. Now, um, in several years ago, I went to Minsk in uh, Belarus. I was with a, a Jewish American group that visited uh, the Holocaust sites. And in one of the sites, they mention in the spring of 1942, on the path we were standing on, they had taken Jews to their death. Now, I'm wondering, well, what does it have to do with me? And it, someone asked me about that. And what happened was I had a memory. And the memory was in that same year, in the same spring, in Seattle, on a cold and dark day, I remember being on a bus going to camp. Now, for a four-year-old, there's nothing you could say or articulate except feeling. On that very day, I remember fear and anxiety. Now, you could say the child could imagine this, but I had the recurrent nightmares throughout my childhood of that very day. So, my testimony is that of a four-year-old child saying that this injustice shouldn't go unspoken. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, why don't we go to the left there, yep. Oh. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> um, his left, okay. Yes, to Mr. Ema's right. Okay. That's you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tony Choi, and I am the organizer for 18millionrising.org. And 18millionrising.org is, an uh, is an organization that brings Asian American communities together online and offline to reimagine Asian American identity with nuance, specificity, and power. And we use technology and popular culture to develop new ways for Asian Americans and our allies to collaborate and create new ways of being and transform the world around us. Um, and because of our emphasis on connecting young Asian Americans to our heritage and social movements, we've long held uh, Fred T. Korematsu in high esteem as an ancestor whose work, speaking out against injustice, um, provides inspiration as we grapple with our own generation's challenges. Mr. Korematsu's life, from his uh, beginnings as the uh, son of Japanese immigrants 
who ran a plant nursery to joining his peers as one of the best known individuals to resist the wartime incarceration of Japanese Americans under the Executive Order 9066. It serves as a powerful reminder that ordinary people are capable of extraordinary courage. And his commitment to speaking out against uh, government profiling against members of other racial, ethnic, and religious groups well into his 80s makes him a lifelong mo role model for all those who know the fight for civil and human rights is an enduring struggle. In these times, examples like Mr. Korematsu are especially important. For every immigrant in the city who feels threatened by xenophobic rhetoric, every Muslim in the city who worries about Islamophobic violence, every black person in the city who fears a chance deadly police encounter, Mr. Korematsu's life story gives strength and hope uh, that the actions of individuals speaking out in the face of prejudice and profiling can and do make a difference for all of us. Fred T. Korematsu Day is a, a celebration of a man who did not give up in the face of adversity because he knew his cause was just. It's an opportunity for all of us, not just Japanese Americans and not just Asian Americans, to honor the work of this freedom fighter and those who worked with him in his lifelong struggle for uh, equal protection under the law. Um, and Fred T. Korematsu Day, uh, I'm going to skip ahead a paragraph. Um, I, I look forward to celebrating uh, Fred T. Korematsu Day on a personal note because, you know, like, as a gay DACA recipient, it's, I look up to figures like uh, Fred T. Korematsu, Edith Windsor, those who came before us because they, they serve as powerful examples of where we can go and who we are. And um, I would like to extend my thanks to the Cultural Affairs Committee for, uh, to bring Mr. Korematsu's life uh, and story into the more attention of more New Yorkers. And, uh, yeah, I hope to celebrate F Fred T. Korematsu Day with you all in 2018. I think you'll get that opportunity, but thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Uh, and I think last but not least. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Councilman Van Bremer and the wonderful people on this council. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to talk to you about this. I understand your issue with regard to Mr. Korematsu. I understand his bravery, his courage, his strength, his fortitude. However, he's not the only one who had that within him. I understand that Asian Americans have suffered from repression during World War II. However, we cannot just all agree, we can agree that all immigrants have suffered from former repression. When the Irish immigrants came here back in the mid to late 1800s, they were repressed and they suffered from discrimination. They were discriminated against on the jobs, and furthermore, their churches were burnt down. I'm sure if you look back in history, that happened. Furthermore, when the Italian immigrants came here, they were mistreated too. They were called very derogatory names, which I'm not going to say here because it would not be appropriate. Uh, furthermore, um, when Hispanic immigrants came here, they've suffered from labor repression. So what I'm trying to get at is this. Every group has suffered some form of discrimination, racism, bigotry, hatred, um, marge, like they were marginalized, targeted, all these other, like, well, however you could describe it, it's all the same thing. They were repressed. And I think we should name, it, instead of just after one person specifically, while he was a great model, model like I've said, we should name it after all immigrants who suffered from repression and all the figures who led the charge in ending repression or uh, discrimination against immigrants. Would you in, be in agreement with that, Councilman Van Reamer and uh, the rest of the panel? Well, generally speaking, we ask the questions, um, but uh, uh, you have 16 more seconds, so I would say that if you're asking me would you be in agreement of naming it after all immigrants instead of just one specific person? While he was a great, a great fighter for Asian Americans, each immigrant group suffered some form of repression and internment. The answer to your question is no, I do not agree with you. I believe that we should name uh, this day after Fred T. Korematsu, which was the purpose of our hearing. Oh, I understand that. So uh, thank you very much for your input. Um, uh, that concludes the testimony for okay, thank you the very hearing. Much. Uh, Councilmember John, would you like to say anything in closing? You know, as an Irish American myself and as the chair of the Irish Caucus, I um, am concerned about your invoking uh, the Irish experience in uh, opposition to the naming of Fred Korematsu Day. It's specifically because of the, uh, I'll get emotional, uh, because of the struggle of the Irish people and as a gay person that I think naming Fred Korematsu Day is so vitally important. 
because I can identify because of the discrimination that my people faced and as a gay man. And that's why it's so important to have Fred Korematsu Day. We need to have Fred's story told mm -hmm. in every single school in New York City, and I will do everything humanly well, possible that. to make that happen. Story Thank you. Told Thank you. I, I think... Uh, uh, I, I think we uh, will uh, excuse uh, this uh, panel and uh, thank uh, everyone for their testimony and just say that uh, uh, not only in, in honor of uh, uh, Fred Korematsu, but also uh, uh, anyone who was here today who, who heard the testimony of uh, Mr. Furumoto and, and Mr. Ima and others uh, agree that it was an uh, incredibly powerful and moving experience and obviously uh, this is the right thing to do. Um, on so many different levels, and, and but a small uh, gesture, but a powerful one at that. So uh, with that, I want to thank every person who's been here today. Uh, thank Councilmember Drum for sponsoring the resolution. Uh, and we will convene again as a, as a committee uh, to vote on this before it goes to the full City Council for a vote. But I would fully expect that we will vote in favor of this resolution very soon. So with that, thank you all very much. This hearing is now adjourned.